Hey, good morning, church. We got a lot to cover today, so let's get started. Last time, we got into the last book of the New Testament. Actually, the last book of the Bible, and the only book of the genre of prophecy in the New Testament, that being the book of Revelation. And we got through the first several chapters, covered some ground. We got a lot more to cover today. If you remember, this book began with a promise of blessing to those who read aloud the words of the prophecy of this book and also to those who keep the words of the prophecy of this book. At the end, Jesus himself in his own words encouraged us, blessed are those who keep the words of the prophecy of this book. So there's got to be some ability to understand what is written in this book in order to be able to keep it. We began last week by looking at the thesis statement. And I believe that's found in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, where it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. That's what this book is about. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. That is, Jesus is coming again, church. Jesus is coming again to this earth. And that's going to be some bad news for a lot of people, but even so, amen. Let it be is what amen means. We also talked about the outline for the book of Revelation in chapter 1, verse 19, where John was instructed to write, therefore, the things you have seen. That was the vision of Jesus in chapter 1. Write those things that are, I believe, regarding the seven churches present in John's day in chapters 2 and 3. And write those things that are to take place after this. And in chapters 4 through 22, that's what happens after this. Look at chapter 4, verse 1, right here. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven... And the first voice I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. That's pretty simple, isn't it? And chapters 4 and 5 were a vision of God on His throne in His majesty and His glory, surrounded by all kinds of incredible things and people, angels and creatures. And John was saddened, if you remember, because... There was no one found worthy to open this scroll that was in the hand of God until it was declared to him. In Revelation 5.5, 5, one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Chapter 6 was about the opening of that first six seals. Now, if you remember... When the seals were broken, things began to happen on earth. And I believe it's a revelation, a revealing and uncovering of what is to happen in a future period on this earth. Chapter 6 was the first six of those seals. Written in it is a description of a period of distress, unmatched in the history of this world and never to be equaled again on this earth. Then we jumped ahead to chapter 13, if you remember, to kind of find the source of this distress on the earth. And the source of this destruction and death was an arrogant, haughty beast, Revelation chapter 13, that was full of boasting and blasphemies. He is also known, as we saw from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as a man of lawlessness. Not just a beast, but a man of lawlessness. He was a king in Daniel chapters 8 and chapter 11. Or maybe you know him based upon John's other writings in his letters as the Antichrist. He is the key to this death and destruction. He's the one who brings it on during this awful period of distress that will come upon the earth in the future. Now, a key concept that we find here as we pick up this week at the end of chapter 6, and if you look there, Revelation chapter 6, is that the beast was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer, Revelation chapter 13. That is why 
just a few verses later, I know you're turning to Revelation 6, keep heading in that direction. That is why just a few verses later in Revelation chapter 13, it says, and look here on the screen, if you're turning, look up. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Why? Why does there need to be a call for the endurance of the saints? Because the beast is allowed to make war on the saints. So those who are alive during that period of time, we've got to endure and hold on to our faith. This beastful man is empowered in his dastardly deeds by Satan himself. This is not conjecture. This is not fanciful interpretation or making up in my own mind. The Bible says these things. Look at Revelation 13, 4. For he had given his authority. It's talking about the dragon, the devil, the serpent, ancient serpent. He had given his authority to the beast. But the good news is this. This awful, unmatched period of distress will be limited in its time. This authority given to the beast by the dragon will be limited in time. This allowance to conquer will be limited in time. This calls for endurance and faith. Look at Revelation chapter 6, starting in verse 12. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken. The sky vanished like a scroll that's being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. What's going on here? This is the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. Verse 15, and then, here's the response, the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who's seated on the throne and from the wrath of of the Lamb. For, here's the point, the great day of the wrath has come. Who can stand? After this period of distress, Jesus is coming and He's bringing wrath. And the response is fear. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Indeed, that is so. But before His wrath is poured out, the great day of the wrath has come, before that wrath is poured out, we see a picture of two things. In chapter 7. And the first in chapter 7 is a picture of some Jews, 144,000, it tells us. Look at chapter 7, verse 3. The instruction given to the angels standing on the four corners of the earth, chapter 7, verse 1, is this in chapter 7, verse 3. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So don't bring this wrath, don't bring this punishment until we seal some folks. And whom is that? Verse 4, And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then it lists the tribes. That's the first picture. The wrath is not brought until the 144,000 servants of God among the Jewish people are sealed. And then the next picture we see is from saved folks from all over the earth suddenly appearing in heaven. Take a look at this. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all the tribes and the peoples and the languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches on their hands, in their hands. Now look at verse 13. Who are these people? Well, that... It answers that. 
One of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these? Clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And I said to him, John said, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They're those coming out of the great tribulation. If you think about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but it says the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are alive will meet them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's what it's describing here. That's why there's this great multitude that nobody can count. It's the history of saints throughout time all being gathered out of this period of distress and coming up into the throne room of God. And it makes sense, does it not, that these angels that are to bring the wrath of God on the earth are told to hold on, hold on, don't do it just yet until we seal the servants of God that have to stay on earth, the 144,000, until we get the saints out of the way, for we are not destined unto God's wrath but we are to receive salvation. They've been caught up, out, from within this awful great tribulation. Is it clear so far? Should be. And then we get to Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. Again, we're taking the broad look. So don't worry about the details just now. Revelation 8, 1, when the Lamb opened the seventh seal. Now we're on the seventh. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Why the silence? I think simply because it's about to get serious. Because now, the wrath of God can come. God has had it, and it is time to repay. As we said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and He's about to bring it. Exact it. So let's summarize so we can stick with the big pick, talking about... What are to be trumpets of God's wrath poured out on this earth? And that's in chapter 8. If you look in verse 6 of chapter 8, the seven angels had the seven trumpets of God's wrath ready to blow them. Verse 7 is the first angel blew his trumpet. Verse 8 is the second angel. Verse 10 is the third angel. Verse 12 is the fourth. You can see the flow of all of this. Get down to chapter 9 is the fifth angel in verse 1. You can see that. And all the way down in verse 13 is the sixth angel blew his trumpet. And if you were to read through there, which I hope you're reading as you have the text for next week before you in the bulletin, some bad things are going on here as we work our way through these trumpets. And then there's kind of an interruption as we get through those first few trumpets. We've gotten through chapter 9. With chapter 10, there's kind of this interruption with the angel and the little scroll, and hey, we're not allowed to know what's going on there, so we're not going to try and figure that out just now. And then in chapter 11, if you notice this, look at chapter 11, verse 15. We finally get to the seventh trumpet. The seventh angel blew his trumpet in chapter 11, verse 15. There are loud voices saying, Hey, good news. The kingdom of God's coming. The Lord's taking over. To summarize, verse 18 really sums it up in chapter 11. The nations raged, but your wrath came. And the time for the judge to be the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants. Who are they? The prophets and the saints. And those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Now we've got to summarize some things that fit back into the period we've already talked about, that period of distress. Chapter 12 is about the dragon, the ancient serpent. That is Satan, who is after two people in chapter 12, or two groups, Israel and Christians. Take a look at chapter 12, verse 4. It says, His tail, this dragon, and it tells you who it is, Satan, swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them into the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman. Now, who's this woman? I'm going to suggest it's Israel, and it should be pretty clear. 
For this woman was about to give birth, and she bore her child that he might devour it. Verse 5, she gave birth to a male child. Look, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But he was caught up to God in his throne. I think that's the ascension of Jesus. And so Satan's there to try to do what he can do to destroy Israel, to destroy Jesus. But not only that, jump down to chapter 12, verse 17. Because the woman was protected, the dragon became furious with the woman. She was protected and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Who's that? On those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, the Christians. And so that's why I think chapters 12 and 13 and 14 should be flashed back into that period of distress. Because that's what's taking place if we saw what we did just see. Chapter 13 describes that beast as we already talked about. The first part of chapter 13, however, he has a sidekick, a second beast in the second part of chapter 13. I want you to look at chapter 13, verse 12. The second beast, 13, 12, exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. Now jump down to verse 16. This might be familiar to you. Also, this second beast causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be marked on their right hand or their forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, and that's the mark of the beast. We're going to find out this second beast later on, and it tells you who it is in Revelation. He's known as the false prophet, the one who perhaps who speaks for the first beast, the man of lawlessness, the king, or the antichrist as he is known. Chapter 14 is just another look at the 144,000. You can see that until we get into chapter 15. Look there. Chapter 15. God has simply had enough. He exacted his trumpet judgments and they would not repent, the people. And so now he's going to finish his wrath. Look at chapter 15, verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing. Seven angels with seven plagues, which are right the last for with them the wrath of God is finished and now look at chapter 16 verse 1 then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God now whereas the trumpets affected about a third of everything the earth the skies the waters the seas the bowls are going to wipe out just about all the rest of everything because we're finishing God's wrath. Satan, the beast, the false prophet, they've had their day. They've had their time. This period of unmatched distress on the earth where they were allowed to conquer and make war on Israel and the rest of her offspring, those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. And yet God has said, this is enough, enough. So he pours out his trumpets. The people don't repent, so now he's ready to finish his wrath. And if you note, the devil having his way, the Jews sealed, the church out of his way, God is now pouring out the wine of his wrath in full strength into the cup of his anger. Now, if you would, I want you to turn in your Bible to chapter 16, if you're not there, with the seventh bowl, chapter 16, verse 17. Look at this. Chapter 16, verse 17, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, what? It's done. It's done. And as a part of that judgment, Chapter 16, verse 19. 
as a part of God's judgment, the great city, what city? You'll learn, was split in three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. So Babylon the great, and it's a mystery what, whom, this is, what city or what it represents. But chapters 17 and 18 are all about God's judgment on the great city of Babylon. And even the first part of chapter 19. If you'll turn, look at chapter 17, verse 1. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, 17.1, Come, I'll show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, referring to Babylon. Now jump down to chapter 18, verse 2. And he called out with a mighty voice, 18.2, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, for she has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. Now in that same chapter, 18, jump down to verse 21. Then the mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. So we get to chapter 19, we're getting toward the end. And after this, verse 1, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for His judgments are true and just, for He has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and avenged on her the blood of the servants. So God is stepping in. And that's the point I want to get to you today where we're going to stop. I hope you're still hanging in there where we've been. We saw kind of what's happening here. Beginning in chapter 1, verse 19, write what you saw, John, vision of Jesus. Write what's going on, John, with the churches in his day, chapters 2 and 3. Write what's going to take place after this, John. So chapters 4 and 5 is a vision of the throne of God in heaven and the scroll. And Jesus can open the scroll. And when he starts opening the scroll, it's describing this awful period of distress that's still to come upon the earth, conducted by Satan, the man of lawlessness, Antichrist, and also his false prophet. And they're going to do dastardly deeds as they boast about being God. And they're going to make war even on the saints until God's had enough and He's ready to pour out His wrath and He seals the 144,000 and He gets the church out of the way and the trumpet judgments begin to be blown upon the earth. And yet still the Bible says even after these plagues the people didn't repent and still Satan's trying to cling to some hopeless end of victory until God says truly enough. And so they pour out the bowls of His wrath upon the rest of the earth, including the great city of Babylon. And that's where we're at. That's really all there is in the big picture. There's a lot of symbolism and a lot of detail and a lot of mystery left. But to understand what's going to happen, we don't need to understand all those details. I want you to see the big picture and that's it. But the point is, church, this calls for the endurance of the saints. And it said, faith. Look there. Faith. You see, you may say, why would God ever allow this to happen to His people? Church, it's happening to His people now. Today. Throughout this world. Christians are being persecuted. They are in tribulation, which is a, a Pressing, a squeezing is what it means. They are in tribulation right now. And yet they continue to cling in desperation to the only one that can save because of their faith. 
And church, no matter what comes upon this earth, we know that God will have His way. And so we need to endure in all faith, knowing that the glory, again, as I've said it before, the glory, the glory, the glory that is to come is unmatched in its splendor and is nothing. That is the trials we face compared to that glory. So church, next week, we're going to look at the glorious return of Jesus Christ when He comes to do away with that dragon and that beast and that false prophet and establish His throne on this earth and we, we, we will reign with Him. It's a promise and you'll see it. Father, thank You for sending Your Savior to this earth the promised one, your son, the one you have said will save us from your wrath. Thank you, Father, that we have come to know this message and cling to the hope of this message so we do not have to endure your wrath but will receive your salvation. Please, Father, help us to endure. Help us to walk in faith no matter what. And for our brothers and sisters who are already walking in through and out of tribulation, God, help them to stand in all conviction, confidence in your faithfulness in the character of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for letting us understand your word. May we keep what is written therein. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.